So what can we do? Well, we can talk about a more a broader model for measuring med risk, and that's through the through beta coefficients. We're going to talk about this again when we talk about security analysis in a few weeks. So the most widely used measure of risk for investments is beta. And again, in line with my policy of trying to disclose uh, upfront what is uh, used in the real world and what is not used in the world, we're going to talk about two kinds of betas right now, corporate betas and market betas. Corporate betas are for conceptual clarity. They illustrate the concept of risk. Market betas really do exist. You can go on Bloomberg or Value Line or any investment site, and you can find the beta for all publicly traded stocks. So the market beta exists, the corporate beta we're using to illustrate for uh, teaching purposes, if you will. So beta rec basically is a, a, a measure of risk that measures the volatility of a firm's returns to the returns on the portfolio, the market portfolio, if it's a market measure, or the organization. Let's just go through each one. So we've got an example here. We've got two HML, high, medium, low risk investments. And we're forecasting these are the rates of return over the next five years. The portfolio P could be either the Standard Poor's 500, that's what we're predicting for the, the stock market over the next five years, or if you're in a not-for-profit and you're thinking about uh, uh, which of those you should invest in, that portfolio P could be what you expect the rate of return on the organization to be, the, the profit, the total margin to be on, on, the, on the organization as a whole. It doesn't matter, either the stock market or the organization. If it's the stock market, we're going to use market data. If it's the corporate or organization, we're going to use the corporate data. So if we regress, and I'm going to show you how to do this in a second uh, on, uh, in Excel, but what we're going to do is we're, we're going to use the slope function in Excel to regress H against P. That will give us the beta of portfolio of asset H. We'll give, we'll, we will regress uh, M against P. That will give us the beta for M and we'll regress L against P, and that will give us the beta for L. And if we do that, we find that H has a beta of 1.5, M has a beta of 1, and L has a beta of 0.5. So what does that mean? Quick. Use for every, for like a percentage increase in the return on P, you see a higher return, or higher return on H than you would on M now, because of a steeper slope? Exactly. So if P is the stock market, and H is uh, Amgen, that, the fact that it has a beta of 1.5 tells us that the stock returns of Amgen are twice as risky, uh, sorry, 1.5 times as risky as the stock market as a whole. So if you expect the stock market to go up 10% next year, then you might expect Amgen to go up 15% because it's more volatile. When you look, when you plot its returns over time, the market may go like this, Amgen goes like this. Because it's the life sciences, you know, it's, it's generally speaking, it may, you would expect to have higher rates of return. What does the 0.5 mean, the L? Is it? L will be half a, will have half the volatility of the market. Right, exactly. So L might be a stock like a, um, in fact, can anyone think of the least risky industry in the American economy? One with the average, lowest average beta. The most predictable industry you can think of. Mining. Mining? Gold. Healthcare timber. Healthcare is down there. It's funeral homes. <laughs> <laughs> Within a few people, you can tell how many bodies are coming in the door next year. Most funeral homes can tell that. They've got very predictable revenue streams. Very predictable future. <laughs> so L could be a funeral home. H could be an Amgen. And what's M? M would market. be market. So the H and M and L are all different investments. Uh, what about what? Are, you're on the right track. What about the market? Like the like the, the S and P that you mentioned, the an index. Right. So we're regressing M against the market. So mm -hmm. if it's one, 
What are we saying about it now? It moves the same rate. It has exactly the same volatility as the market. So this is a way of categorizing risk. H has got volatility greater than the market. M has a volatility the same as the market, and L has the volatility that is lower than the market. Now we can also say P, I said market here, we can also put in P as the expected profitability of the organization. And then what we would say is H is twice as volatile as the average project in our organization. And that will give you the corporate beta. So that's just what we've summarized. So, Beta is dependent, just to understand what's going on here. Beta is, generally speaking, uh, we've just talked, the example we've talked about, we have the beta of 1.5, beta of 1, and beta of 0 0.5. So what's going on there? Well, two things are going on there. Beta is equal to the standard deviation of the investment over the portfolio or the market times the correlation between those two. So it's dependent on two things. It's dependent on the relative amount of standard deviation and the, the, and the correlation, the direction of change. So for example, um, if RIM is negative, then you're going to get a negative beta. Well, negative beta stocks generally don't exist. But, uh, if you can tell, though, that the, if RI, sigma i is twice as large as sigma m, then that's going to produce a higher betas, because the stock's variation is greater than the market's variation. So there's two things going on in beta. So how do we use these measures? Well, if you are an investor, as all of you will be, uh, the <clears throat> market portfolio, then the relative value, the, re the relative measure of risk that's important to you is market risk. If you're speaking as a manager, Matt, the, Matt, the, uh, the type of risk that's relevant to you is corporate risk. So why am I saying that? Well, as a, as a business a shareholder, for, for example, uh, an investor-owned healthcare organization, their shareholders, the market data is going to be of interest to them because they are interested in the risk of HCA, for example, to their portfolio versus the managers of HCA who are more interested in the project, how risky is this project compared to the other projects that I'm managing. So portfolio betas, whether they're talking about corporate betas or market betas, there are weighted averages of the betas of the individual components. So you can regress, you can find the beta for every single project or, uh, or investment asset that you're managing. So now how do, how do we put all this together? We've got these seemingly disparate issues. We've got expected rate of return. We've got uh, different measures of risk. How do we put this all together so that we have a tool for decision making? And that was done in the 1970s by uh, Richard Roll and um, a few other uh, researchers who came up with the capital asset pricing model. And the, what this model is, is it is a relationship between the amount of risk and the amount of return. So remember when I asked you the trick question, how do you decide about between the clinic and the MRI? And I said, we well, can't because you don't know whether the increase in risk is worth the increase in return. This model allows you to make that decision because it takes into account the risk and the return. And the basic structure of the model is, 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 is at the bottom of the slide. The required rate of return on equity. <clears throat> so the common stock of an organization the required rate of return that investors want from that, or that stock is equal to the risk-free rate, typically measured by uh, treasury bond rate, plus the difference between the required rate of return on the market, the stock market, minus the risk-free rate, times its beta. So we'll go through this and we'll show you an example that makes this a little more intuitive. So suppose we go to the website and we find that the risk-free rate right now is 6%. Required, we, all the uh, stock market analysts think that the, the uh, return on the market is going to be 10% over the next year. And we know that the beta of our organization is 1.5. We do the arithmetic, the 6% risk-free rate plus the difference between the required rate of return on the market, the 10 and the 6, and we multiply that times the beta of 1.5. 
We do all the arithmetic, and we find that the required rate of return on this stock is 12%. So what do you notice about that 12%, the required rate of return on the stock, compared to the required rate of return on the market? It's higher. Why? What did you say? It's riskier. It's riskier than the 1.5 is higher than right. 1. Its beta is greater than 1. It's riskier than the market. So the market, investors adjust their expectations. Investors are not naive. They know that the stock is riskier than the market. So this model says they're going to adjust their required rate of return. If you want me to invest $1,000 of my money in your company, you're going to have to compensate me for that additional risk. So this is a model for specifying the relationship between risk and return. Notice uh, that I will use occasionally the term RM minus RF, which is the, the bracketed term, the RM, RRM minus RF. That's also known as a market risk-free premium. So some of the practice problems will have RM minus RF, and some will have uh, RPM, I think it is, which is the risk premium for the market. Those are the same thing. So we can then graph these three things and to construct the security market line. And what this says is that uh, you can see the three assets. The beta is on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, and the required rate of return is on the uh, vertical axis. And all this shows you is that different levels of risk, there are different levels of required rate of return. Risk is not bad. You might be very content to invest in H if you get 12% rate of return on it. There's nothing wrong with H, even though it's higher risk, if the rate of return equals, is comp if, you, if the amount of risk you're assuming is compensated for by return. A word of caution about CA Pen. Well, before I go on to that, okay, so this is the required rate of return. I claim now do you want to compare that to the expected rate of return. And what will what information will that give you? What decision can you make when you make that comparison? Here's what I require as an investor. Here's what I think is going to happen. What happens if I compare those two numbers? Right. But you can decide if you're going to buy the stock or if you don't. Exactly. And with what circumstance would you buy? Well, if the required rate of return is lower than the expected rate of return, you would buy. Right. So think through what Jorge has just said. We In this stock right here, we have decided that the required, <coughs> the required rate of return on this asset is 12%. Given the risk of this stock, I say as an investor, I need 12% if you're going to invest in this stock. Based on all my research, I look at financial analysts and forecasts, and I think this stock is actually going to give me 14% rate of return, then I would buy it. Because my expected rate of return is greater than my required rate of return. In other words, I demand 12%, but I think 14 is going to happen. Therefore, that's the stock I want to buy. What would happen if the expected rate of return on the stock was 8%? You wouldn't want to buy it. I, I demand 12% because it's a risky stock, but all the financial analysts think it's only going to give 8%. This is a stock I would not buy. So this is a nice handy tool for making investment decisions. On the other hand, there are some limitations to it, which I will let you read about it. Um, the most important thing is that it provides a rational way of thinking about risk and return. It's used a lot in the real world by investment managers, uh, even, with, even though it has these uh, uh, limitations. Okay, before I go through the practice problems, any questions about the basic concepts that we've gone through? Your question. Um, back on slide 28. Yeah, you have a, a form. Yeah. What is the RIM scale? Correlation coefficient. Is that just usually given or? 
Um, you can you calculate in the real world market days are calculated by companies that go through and analyze historic returns of different corporations, and these are statistical calculate. You can use you can calculate correlation coefficient in Excel. You plot two rows and two columns of numbers. 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 6, 7, 8, 7, 3, 4. You can use the correlation coefficient function in Excel to actually calculate the correlation coefficient. And it will be something between negative 1 and plus 1. Is it row? Is it not? Is it not row? Is what row? Is the R like the letter row? Or like the you mean there's a formula name? Yes. I think it's C O O C O R R E L in Excel. I could be wrong. Other questions? I have a question. On, going back to slide 14, and it's a little farther back, but um, you talked about the assets perfectly negatively correlated and perfectly positively correlated. What was the third one you mentioned? Less than positively correlated. Positively correlated, but less than one, to be technically accurate. You said the Dow is less than a risk reduction, right? Is anything less than one is going to give you some risk reduction. The only circumstances where there is no risk reduction is if they are perfectly positively correlated. Thank you. Perfectly negative. A and B are perfectly negatively correlated. A and B, A and C are perfectly positively correlated. And A and D are positively correlated, but less than 1. So AD is actually the most common. That's reality. A and D is reality. You will never find assets that are perfectly negatively or perfectly positively correlated. They're almost always going to be AD. And that was shown in this slide right here. That's AD right here. It's less than positive, but positively correlated, but less than 1. Yeah. Um, can you um, just repeat again how you know um, that AC is perfectly positively correlated? How I know that what? Um, AC is perfectly, has a perfect... Well, compare A and what happens in A and C. In the very poor state, A is negative 10, C is negative 25. And look at the, other, at the other end. If A, the best case scenario, that is perfectly monotonically increasing. Minus 10 to 0, to 10 to 20 and 30. So it goes up 10% every single time. C, on the other hand, goes down by 20% every time. So they are perfectly negatively correlated. When one is high, the other is low. When one is low, the other is high. Other questions? Okay, let's check it crack at the true or false Investors should not be considered concerned with the individual risk of individual stocks, but rather what it does to the risk of its entire portfolio. Inflation and recession, high interest rates cannot be diversified away. They're not company specific. They cannot be diversified away. They cause market risk. True or false? It's 
false. It's false because any increase in the market risk premium will increase the required rate of returns. It's just that it won't increase it as much for low beta stocks. So Can you say that one more time? Mm -hmm. An increase in the market risk premium, so this is assuming the risk-free rate stays the same. So that means that investors' expectations of where the stock market is going next year, let's say it goes from 4% to 6%, that increase will be reflected in the required rate of return of every stock it's just that the increase in low beta stocks won't be as great as the increase in high beta stocks. So changes in expectations about the market will dramatically affect high beta stocks. They won't affect as much low beta stocks because they're lower volatility in the market. 